Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome from wherever you are. Uh, so before I introduce the guest speaker, I also just wanted to uh, make you aware of our next and final event for this semester. And that takes place on Thursday, 26th of, Mar of May. Uh, so all our events are the last Thursday of each month. So it's easy to remember. Uh, so at the end of May, we will be hosting a discussion on a film called Adieu Lacan, which you might have seen circulate circulating around the internet, uh, and which will be joined by the director Richard Leeds, or Leeds, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, and the film depicts uh, analysis between an analysant and Lacan. Uh, and you can watch the film a few days beforehand uh, for tickets uh, $10 or concession $5 uh, for a week if, uh, or five days or something before the event. Uh, but our event is free as usual, and we'll discuss the film. Uh, so we do hope you make it along to that. And uh, more details can be found on our website, uh, lacaninscotland.com. Okay, so our guest speaker tonight is none other than Hilda Fernandez Alvarez. Hilda is a Lacanian psychoanalyst based in Vancouver, Canada, uh, who has a lot of uh, clinical experience in both a public and private setting. Uh, she has just finished writing up her PhD uh, at Simon Fraser University, um, and her PhD is titled Mapping the Discursive Spaces of Trauma and Healing in Mental Health, the Institutional Unconscious. Uh, also worth noting is that Hilda co-founded the Lacan Salon, which you might have heard of, um, in 2007, and she currently serves as its clinical director. And she's also a very good dancer, I have to add. <laughs> Um, but today she is here to talk about a concept that usually slips through uh, our fingers in the Lacanian world, um, but I'm sure this event won't slip through our fingers. Uh, so Hilda, thank you so much for doing this, and I will pass it on to you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Amanda, uh, my sister, and thank you to Neil Callum as well um, for the kind invitation to uh, participate in the Lacan in Scotland. In this talk, I will introduce the ancient myth of the Danaidas as an excuse to engage uh, with the central question that surplus reasons throws at the core of psychoanalytic practice. I have engaged with this question for, for various years, and I truly believe the concept is a powerhouse, also freshly articulated in my recently concluded dissertation. Um, so let's start. The Greek myth of the Danaidas, recorded by ancient writers such as Euripides, Ovid, and Plato, tells the story of the 50 daughters of Danaus, a king of Egyptian and Greek lineage, who are forced to marry the 50 sons of Aegypus, no Aegypus, Aegyptus, uh, Danaus' twin brother and enemy. The marriage of the Danaids has a tragic fate because to free themselves, they follow the paternal advice and slay their husbands on their wedding nights with daggers, later to beheaded them, beheaded them and throw their heads into a marsh. Because of this act, the Danaides were condemned in the lower world to expiate their sins by eternally filling a leaky jar with water. Lacan uses the myth of the Danaides in seminar 16 and seminar 17 to instantiate the logic of jouissance depicted as the jar of the Danaides. Once you have started, quote, once you have started, you never know where it will end. It begins with a tickle and ends in a, in a blaze of petrol. That is what, psychoana what, that is what jouissance is always about, maybe psychoanalysis too. So uh, let's go to the myth. This myth has diverse and fragmentary sources and also multiple cultural reproductions. I read the play of, uh, by Achilles, the suppliants, and saw the opera Les Danaides by Antonio Saglieri, but the myth served me only as an entry point to the study of surplus reasons because in no way I'm a scholar of classic studies. What I want to retake from the myth is the figure of uh, Hippomnestra, which is the only daughter from the 50 who is willing to spare the death of her newly wedded husband, cousin Linsus. 
Hypermnistra is a central figure in Ovid's work on the Heroides, a series of letters from ancient mythical women, and also in Geoff Geoffrey's Chaucer's legend of Hypermnistra. The sources can agree if Hypermnistra renounces her father's authority to kill her new husband as a grateful response from not being forced to have sex on the wedding night or because she is in love. I, however, after disobeying her father, she finds herself in a complicated situation. She is in prison and faces the threat of death. Yet she manages to keep herself alive. In some versions, Lincius, the, the cousin, the new uh, husband, kills the nows and sometimes kills the Danites uh, as well, except Hyperministra, while in other versions, Lincius and the nows are reconciled. In all tellings of the myth, Hypermnistra and Lincius remain married and found a royal line at Argos. A feminist reception sees this legend as another variation of the theme of wifely loyalty base. Um, for example, uh, the, the structure of the exchange of women in which the transacting fathers are as structurally, economically, and psychologically significant as the transacted woman um, and the men to whom they are married. That was a quote. Hypermnistra goes beyond placer de patri, pleasing the father, because um, uh, Ferkulson mentioned she, she manages, she writes a letter, this is in the Heroides, she writes a letter that is addressed to both father and, and the husband. It is, uh, Ferkulson said, it is um, her rhetorical and epistolary skill that contributes to her survival. Unlike many of the heroines, Hippomnistra is reunited with her addressee, Lincius. She is not killed and doesn't commit suicide, unquote. Did our heroine get all what she wanted? Preserving her life after successfully disobeying the father, preserving her husband and the love of her father? What about the eternal condemnation of her sisters? Uh, and what about the various versions of assassination between father and lover? I do not think the Greek tragedy ignores the residues of discourse as the Hollywood happy endings do. However, for the key um, aspect of, uh, of my talk, she's able to renounce surplus reasons uh, from the imposed form of uh, enjoyment in her tradition, do shall kill your husband instead. And by mere rhetorical calculations in her letter from prison addressed to both her father and her husband, she plays her destiny with language. That's what I think is the most important. So I'm gonna uh, give you a little bit of uh, intermezzo. <laughs> well, she has, she has a beautiful area there, but I just wanted to show like the force of her a pledge to the father that she says, um, yeah, kind of, uh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be an assassin, but um, you can Google that and um, enjoy that beautiful part. But uh, let's go back to the, to the, um, let's go back to the theory because we need time. So goodbye, Hypermnistra, but we will take her again. But that's the core of what I wanted to retake from the Danites. There's one, um, not the exception, because uh, she is uh, finding her way through language, but also through her act, that, um, that we're able to defy the, the father, to cut surplus reasons and um, play her destiny with language, as I said. What the Danaides give us topologically is the very form of the drive which is the psychoanalytic concept of major importance to understand compulsion repetition because the drive's purpose is circulating the same circuit over and over. There's plenty of research, there's plenty of talk about kind of what happens with the drive. The drive um, was defined by Freud as the frontier, quote, between the mental and the somatic as the psychical representative of the stimuli originated from within the organism and reaching the mind, unquote. For Lacan, the drive is a myth, a fiction, or a montage. 
but mostly a fundamental concept to understand the subject of the unconscious in its relation to compulsive repetition and results. The drive has various characteristics such as thrust, drunk, a constant force that builds tension to unpleasurable levels and is the motor factor that pushes for a discharge of internal excitations. The drive also has a source, well, which emerging from the rim-like erotogenic offices, orifices, <laughs> offices, orifices such as the mouth, the anus, of, or the eye engenders libidinal energy that participates in the exchanges between the internal and external worlds. The force of the drive within the body searches for an object, which Freud considered of little importance because as Lacan explains, is an absence known as object petit a, cause of desire, around which the drive circuits to gain a partial satisfaction that alleviates the pressing displeasure. Before going into the core of surplus results, we must locate how this concept sits in psychoanalytic theory. In Freud, surplus results can be accounted via his two topographies, sometimes known as the structural first topography of unconscious, preconscious, and conscious, and the dynamic topography or metapsychology, ego, id, and superego, added to the apparatus of the libidinal economy based on the antagonisms of drives capixis, which incorporates notions such as quantum of affect or sum of excitations. Lacan's topology of the drive added to theory of this course accounts for surplus reasons. I won't detail these my themes, created by Lacan to extrapolate the understandings achieved in the clinic onto the political in the context of the events of 1968. And this is in seminar 16, seminar 17, radiophony. This theory proposes four quaternary formulas to detail social bonding supported by language, even when there is no speech. With these algebraic formulas, Lacan attempts to bring the whole of his theoretical apparatus to a minimalistic expression to understand as structures that host overdetermined embodied practices, shedding light into the functioning of society by, by counting individual ways of desiring and enjoying. Hence, surplus results involves the two scales. Right, we can see here with Lacan the subject and the social, which take us to two of uh, my dissertation's conceptual axes: is the scalar parallax and the two bodies. A scalar parallax incorporates two terms. A scale expresses qualitative and quantitative levels that involve size, but also perceptions of size tainted by fantasy. Parallax indicates perception of depth or movement and refers to the mechanism of alternating focus. These, term, these terms used to calculate measurements in astronomy to focus opti optical perception or to create aesthetics of movement and depth in films and digital productions, such as video games, um, is useful to think social linkage because it clarifies how the social and the individual appear always in alternation. One can focus one side, the psychic of the individual subject, or the intersubjective social discourse. I claim as elsewhere that in approaching the relationship between the social and the individual, we can see the rope, rope of the collective, but not the quality of each of its fibers. When engaging scalar parallax through estimate space, I mean, Lacan work with the cross cut, with the Moebius, I retake that in my thesis as well. We could analyze how each scale presents different challenges and at times demands a divergent heuristic strategies, such as in the case of surplus reasons. Uh, I claim that in the, in the side of the subject, the, the loss has to be incorporated in the side of the social, that loss needs to be redistributed to recalibrate the um, libidinal economy. I also engage with um, the drive uh, kind of a, has a scalar uh, as well. It has a scale, has a scalar perspective and two bodies. Um, 
my, my uh, friend, Clint Burnham, has studied two bodies as well when he talks about the coronaviruses in the kind of um, context of governance. Um, so uh, my perspective is that um, the subject's body of just sounds refers to the private scale of the individual whose flesh is embodied by language from the moment they enter the symbolic order and as a result generates the phenomen phenomenon of jouissance and excess leading to compulsive repetition, a constant hurdle for the subject to become. The second body is at the, social, at the social scale and refers to the body politic, a public collective body that sustains social special practices made by the sum of one plus one. It, it is the collectivization of desires, enjoyment and suffering, and also um, working on an ideological grip, which has possibilities for political action, the body politic, if the body politic finds and mobilizes its know-how, which I understand as gaining power through the liberation of enjoyment from the imposed master signifier, as much as traversing the ideological grip of fantasy and accepting the residue or signifying or inscribing rather than signifying the, the loss is in, not signifiable, but inscribing the loss. The drive is akin to both the individual and the social, but the drive can be thought of in the same way. Perhaps Leo Turk renders the best version of the drive. This is a long quote because I love it. You cast away a flower wilting on your table, but what if a rotten odor emanates from your very lungs and lingers over the world around you? Or from your liver a melancholia? you will be asthmatic, or you will have hepatitis, but also you may produce a musical work which, can, which may be of heavenly inspirations or poems out of breath or di diaphanous watercolors or xenophobia or ironism. The pulsion drive cannot be eliminated as a stimulation originating outside because it doesn't have its own efferent channels ready to be used. The physiology of the organic body is not sufficient to, sufficient to regulate the discharge of the pulsion or the drive." Unquote. Lyotard's poetic rendition of the drive as akin to individual and social scape is Freudian in essence because Freud posed two types of drive, the erotic drive charged by libido and the dead drive charged by the very same force torn into the strudel. A division that Lacan clarified when he emphasized the estimate continuity as there is an, quote, essential affinity of every drive with the zone of death that makes present sexuality in the unconscious and represents in its essence death, unquote. When we apply a scalar analysis to Lacan's theory of discourse, we have the axis of representation which focuses on the sliding of signifiers, while the axis of production illuminates the obtained material production within discourse. Surplus sounds can be elucidated exclusively when focuses on the axis of production and is akin to both the subject body of Dussan's and the force of the body politic, because as a manifestation of the drive pushes bodies and communities of bodies towards a paradoxical excess that results in a loss of enjoyment. Let's jump into what is surplus resistance. This picture I took it last year when we were having in Vancouver a horrible, horrible um, heat. And you can see the, the sad uh, face of the little dog there. Just, just, it was so hot. It was very, very intense um, part of the, the devastation we are now facing. Anyways, if focused from the subject perspective, we can understand it through the logic of saying such as the hair of the dog that bit, bit you, an English saying or box populi that prescribes the use of alcohol to cure the intoxicating effects of a hangover, or the yappy motto, work hard, play hard. The idea is to cure excess with excess, to up the ante to fabricate a game, fantasmatic, that could cover a loss. 
But surplus resource always conjures up this course because the subjects produce enjoyment by the mere act of speaking. I am enjoying myself as I am speaking. Yet um, through social bonding, a residue exceeds the structure. The site of surplus resign is where the negative, the excluded or rejected actualizes. And it is this very site where another discourse can be initiated. I fo if focused from this course, surplus resigns constitutes a whole that makes these courses torn or be relayed by another. Um, Lacan says, quote, the expense of jouissance necessitates the surplus enjoyment plus de jure for the discursive mechanism to turn. So this, this highlighted aspect, and I like um, in the right, I left the, the, the kind of the circle open because there is where, where the discourse can retake into another um, direction. I did a little bit um, of um, an analysis on the um, tragic assassination of George Floyd at the time. Um, that occur in the kind of I try to approach from a discursive perspective to um, see how white supremacist uh, discourse uh, occurs within um, within different people in different kind of temporalities or specialities, but however that that uh, sustain the same kind of master um, signifier of white supremacy. So I, I brought this, uh, I presented this when I um, presented a uh, kind of a book, A Spectre of Fascism, where I work on the traumatic residue and its inscription. So I, I kind of, um, this, this reads like that. The black man, uh, the bird watcher, Oliver, it was his name, addresses the woman that call, I, I don't know if you remember that situation, I'm sure you do, uh, when um, he, she uh, is bothered by, by his uh, request of um, on kind of leashing the dog in a park in New York, and then she calls the, the um, um, how do you say, the, the police, saying that he was being, she was being assaulted. And then I, I say that this white supremacist um, uh, signifier is what addresses police, that in a different space and temporality is the police who um, um, kills obscenely to the side of everyone, George Floyd. So in this discourse, the master discourse, um, it, it is uh, the residual is occupied by, by George Floyd's uh, body. And that is retaken, let's say, by Black uh, life matters in a way of protesting into what Lacan calls the hysteric discourse. It is retaking that residue is is retaking to be relaunched to be the cause, as I'll show you in the next one. Um, so uh, it kind of uh, here the 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 this residue right in the master is is the cause of the hysteric. So that's that's kind of what I mean that the surplus resource is what it can be taken to another discourse. Um, in Lacan's university discourse, the know it all, I call it the know it all, the surplus production corresponds to a specific kind of subjectivity, which if there's to question the dominant epistemology will be excluded. Lacan's hysteric discourse, over here, the, this uh, discourse of protest, I, I, I argue, obtains knowledge as residual production. For Lacan's master discourse, as well as for the capitalist discourse, which I didn't put here, the, the surplus production is the object and death. Yet, there is another way of producing a surplus constituted by a subjectively produced master signifier in the analyst discourse that bends the topology of the structure to inscribe the residue. This side of the remainder is favorable to relaunch discourse, hence is a site where a decision can be made. Various Lacanian authors have rendered surplus usance as a fantasy, which is the constitutive field that covers the traumatic lack in the other to permit the staging of the subject's desire and sons. Will Greenshields, Greenshields works topologically on Lacan's theory of discourse and locates surplus sons as a 
quote, circular discs which can be supplemented to the Movian structure of the subject and in doing so, grant his fantasy a fictive consistency and coherence, unquote. So he's talking about pretty much the cross cut as sort of um, accounting for the fantasy of the subject. Sheldon George, when he's discussing um, the Afro-American trauma um, of slavery, renders surplus resistance as a fantasy of being. It is a fantasy because the subject is existence, capture in language, lacks a tangible being. We are lack of being. Surplus Your Sands has also been rendered by Dries Dolster and Sting Dan Holling as a fantasy of communication because the quote, the structure of language is only a fabrication, a surplus, which make us believe that speech, which primarily echoes corporal tension and enjoyment, has a communicative function, unquote. But surplus resound can exhaust its conceptual potency through the qualitative aspect of the logic of fantasy. It is of utmost importance to articulate economic aspects of this phenomenon if one wants to approach the subjective and social special expenditures and residues of this course. The economic aspect of surplus Usance is based on the topology of the drive, we say it already, and topology as the image that can help us think the impossible, whose sole aim is to, uh, the, the drive uh, by basically wants to return to the departure to launch itself once again. The drive, Lacan says, knows no day or night, no spring or autumn, no rise and fall. It is a constant force, unquote, that is not of the order of the rhythmic biolo biological function. Sorry, that was the unquote. And refers to the dialectics of lack, excess, expenditure, loss, and residue that sustain the libidinal economy as much as the socioeconomic material conditions of inequality in society. For Freud, the quantitative condition of the drive is possible to diffuse only by qualitative means. Equally, surplus resign is never recalibrated by a magical energetic redistribution, but rather is an effect of the qualitative intervention of language, such as when analysts and find a word to dislodge themselves from a fantasy or decode the ciphering of a symptom. The Slovenian, uh, Slavok Zizek and Samo Tomczyk are perhaps the Lacanian scholars who have uh, explored surplus resigns the most with a focus on the economic dimension of enjoyment. I noted Magoan also has engaged, I didn't read it this time. Um, translating reasons for enjoyment is not particularly auspicious because can get confused with pleasure principle. I noticed that a lot in kind of um, sometimes in the dialogues uh, that are in social media that it's almost uh, pair. And for a clinician, that's a no-no because resistance is one thing and pleasure is, I mean, it's a continuum, but it is a very distinct aspect that you see in the clinic. Um, so it also kind of translating resistance for enjoyment leaves beside important connotations that the word resistance affords, such as property, the sexual nature of pleasure and the morbidity of loss and excess. Zizek explains surplus resistance as a mature notion of Lacan's object petita and, the, as, and as the Freudian Lotzke win, win or gain of pleasure. He writes, long quote, if there is a surplus, excessive wealth on the one side and a lack, poverty on the other side, why can we reestablish the balance by simply redistribution taking the wealth from those excessively rich and give it to the poor? The formal answer, because lack and surplus are not located within the same space where they are just unequally distributed. Some people lack things, others have too much. The paradox of wealth resides in the fact that the more you have, the more you feel the lack. It's again, the super ego paradox. The more you follow the injunction, the more guilty you are." Unquote. Um, 
Tom Chick sees the problem uh, of Jusans as a real illness. He engages in this um, book. I really like this book because it kind of uh, gives you a mirror, <laughs> just uh, reflect, reflected the labor and enjoyment. Um, he, he works, uh, yeah, kind of at the distinction and the continuation of uh, uh, kind of pleasure, jouissance, and, and how it is um, related to exploitation. And he sees surplus as really uh, an illness. Elsewhere, I have engaged with the concept through the analysis, through the concept of surplus jouissance, through the analysis of the master signifier in relation to environmental devastation and the rise of extreme right-wing political movements in the globe proposing the politics of inscription of dramatic residues. I also approach surplus resistance through the phenomenon of the Aokigahara forest in Japan, which had become a popular destination for suicide tourism. Both texts were concerned with the inscription of residues, inscribing the leak properly, a senseless loss, a traumatic absence of signification. And I want to approach today surplus resistance from a different vantage point instead of the production side, inter, instead of the, the side of the object. I want to focus on the thrust, the force that pushes the topology of the drive or the expenditure, which I locate in the process of valorization. Let's, let's um, untie this knot. So I, I have um, work on the traumatic residue and I want to see how the concept of valuation works for the expenditure for what throws um, the, the, the whole kind of topology. Um, psychoanalysis and Marx, um, psychoanalysis uh, from Freud and Marx's historical materialism, both signal on behalf of the discontent in society, which finds its epitome in the environmental crisis that we live now. When Lacan describes structuralism as simply seriousness, because it's concerned with the opaque aspects of the structure, Lacan equates the logic of surplus resistance, the psychic mechanism that is launched intersubjectively in discourse, and surplus value, the excessive production that abstracts labor while obscures it, and rendered them as homologous. If we assume that both mechanisms are equivalent, not only logically, but spatially, we could render them as homotopic, as possibly being deformed into one another. That means that the mechanism that affects the subject's body of jouissance and the body politic reproduce the current economy. It is a continuation of the subjective excess. But these energetic notions are not working separately from language as they are shaped by it. Valorization is, um, yeah, well, kind of, that's a little bit like too wordy, <laughs> but let me tell you what is this about. Valorization is very important for a subject, society and economy alike. The valorization of self as object of the other's desire for psychoanalysis here, which I, I kind of, I am doing here, locating that the experience expenditure is a force for valoration, valorization. Um, um, at kind of a, the valorization of identity or the struggle to death for recognition for society, Hegel's, corresponds to the valorization at stake in surplus, uh, at stake in the social scale, while the lack of surplus value is what leads to the obscene self-valorization of capital. That, that would be Marx. The surplus resistance won't stop. It is the force of life and death. It is part of the subjective catastrophe or being humans trapped in language. Uh, we had a recent event in the Lacan Salon. David Marriott says we are enslaved by language. Um, so the side of uh, subject's valorization is precisely where surplus resistance can be launched differently. So one way is when we kind of get the loss to signify or when it, it launches, not because there is an answer in the subjective social and economic curse. There's no answer for that, I believe, but because the question can be launched in a totally different direction, which I will explain in my last point to conclude. The, the best way to focus um, 
surplus jouissance is through the environmental crisis. Surplus jouissance is the madness of human proliferation in every account, the force that unleashes unhinged consumerism and is pushing, pushing us to mass extinction and planetary destruction. Uh, Lacan says, uh, we literally in seminar um, 16, he says, we are fucked by enjoyment. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the problem in a way. We want to enjoy, we want pleasure, but it goes away. Um, some scientists, uh, scientists commend that it took us only 50 years, quote, and let's be clear, we are refers to the richer people of the richer countries to push the air beyond the 10,000 years of extraordinary stability, unquote. 10 millennia in 50 years. The homotopic continuation of surpluses makes surplus usan the linchpin that, that meets the real quite structure and the real quite in, uh, impossibility. So what I, what I mean is um, the, it, it is through this residual uh, aspect that we can locate the, the kind of the connection of the real between what structures um, kind of our life, right? Like uh, the structures are not walking in the streets. We walk on the structure. We give our flesh to them. So, and it connects with the real as the impossibility. To extrapolate for a possible heuristic of the drive in the social, a true impossibility for sure, I want to explain how surplus resistance is addressed in the clinic. An impossible that indeed an impossibility that indeed can be uh, redirected. Yeah, no. let's, let's just stay here. Uh, in clinical practices, two locations are opportune to intervene to that redirect the leak of surplus resistance. At the thrust, as I mentioned before, expenditure or at the traumatic residue. The economic libidinal recalibration based on Freud's qualitative diffusion of the drive occurs always through language and a cut on the signified chain, a polyphony, an alliteration, a punctuation, or an intervention on act may allow to change the direction of the quantum of actor towards desire, the only notion we know that can provide a form of satiation or satisfaction to the voracity of the sub subject, even unprecisely because desire assumes the lack and accepts loss. When someone finds a limit to their excess, it doesn't mean that, they, that they, the excess will stop, but rather by means, of the, by means of an act or the event, a truth procedure for Badu, the subject gets to decide on the values of truth that had defined them thus far. The lead won't stop, but gets redirected in such a way that the excess goes into pleasure, pleasure principle, ethically examined and not to oppressive duissance. For example, when an, an analysand says, I want to be heard, and within the context of the uterine and the history of her amorous life, the analyst hear an, homo, an homophony, I want to be heard, something that actually she could hear. Or someone that says, I am shat, and the analyst responds with a question on the polyphony. Do you mean that shat? Even more clear, someone decides to act on their addiction to alcohol and one day literally leaks the excess away by buying the finest bottle with the only purpose to drain it with no more enjoyment but that of accepting a loss. Those interventions or acts actions, acts, events, are possibilities that open a space to redirect the lead. The clinic that I call of the social bonding aims at redirecting surplus science by the end of analysis when the subject account for the residual left by the loss without imperiously rushing into yet another excess or imputing it into others. By a poetic act, hypermnistra, of the linguistic order, not because there's a speech to, to account for this, but a poetic act, the residue gets to inscribe something of the impossibility. And love, Lacan says, love becomes a mere contingency that traps a letter and finds a know-how with the residue of your sons, 
which launches the question of the impossible sexual relationship in a different direction that is no longer of impetus. Um, and what about the social? Yeah, we have 15 minutes. This is an, a true impossible answer. How the drive gets redirect, redirected in the body politics? What to do with the imperative of growth? This question has battalion echoes. It, quote, it, it is not necessity, but it's contrary, luxury, that presents living matter and mankind with their fundamental problems, unquote. What heuristics are needed to deal with the leak of Jewish in this scale social? Tom Chick's response is a self-asserted, non-conclusive, open question about feminine jouissance and uh, not all. Why Gigi goes to the traversion of the fantasy for us uh, kind of advocating for a substance-less subjectivity. And he says, in order to change our future, we should first not understand, but change our past reinterpreted in such a way that opens up towards a different future from the one implied by the predominant vision of the past. In front of what we face, the sixth mass extinction, the planetary devastation, inequality um, becoming more dramatic, war, uh, zoonotic uh, illnesses, I believe that the surplus resistance re relates to how a community negotiates the common goods. The economy of the good is mostly problematic, not only because of finicky human jealousies, petite narcissism, and colonial brutality, but also because we don't know how to locate ethically the place of the residual sur surplus, which involves a conscious decision as to what we are willing to sacrifice and under what conditions for the community we desire. Lacan secretly influenced by Bataille's general economy and not losing his focus on what allows desire's assertion, states that there is a practice conceived to have a salutary function in the maintenance of intersubjective relations, unquote, and which consists in the possibility of, quote, destruction that is carried out consciously and in a controlled way. How do we decide? How do we decide to sacrifice? What kind of satisfaction is possible? Um, this uh, requires a kind of a, a environmental response from the body politic that has become the, the generalized environmental proletariat because um, climate change and the crisis that we are uh, experiencing is not only, uh, I mean, affects more severely those that are um, kind of in conditions of uh, more precarity, more bare, kind of the bare life, but it affects uh, a, a lot of uh, people in, in richer countries as well. So we are the generalized environmental proletariat. And that's a term I took from someone that um, I, it is escaping at the moment, uh, but has studied uh, the environmental proletariat. Cutting the madness of surplus requires a social poiesis, the sculpting, losing material rather than painting, adding material. How to stop the leak beyond the denial of the residue, zero waste. Um, how to um, go about the, the, the thrust of uh, ever growing more and more. There are some examples of economic uh, degrowth the croissance is the term that is used. And it is interestingly um, embodied much more by indigenous communities. For example, Vivir Bien in Ecuador, Los Zapatistas in Mexico, and uh, Rojava uh, in, um, in the Kurdish uh, communities. Can that sort of model of um, communal, um, distribution of the common goods and resistance against the brutality of um, kind of colonial imperialistic um, capitalism, can that be brought to the global herb, to the big glowing city? That's my question for you. And I'm finishing here, thank you.
Thank you so much, Hilda. That was excellent. Um, so Callum usually asks questions. <laughs> uh, should I start with the question? Um, yeah, I thought maybe I'll start things off. Um, and hopefully this doesn't sound like too much of a question you'd get at your PhD defense. But um, I was it was interesting the just the choice of discourses. Um, and you talked a lot about that in relation to social issues and collectivity and things like that. Um, I was, yeah, I was wondering what made you choose to bring in the discourses? And also, do you think, because you're also a clinician, do you think there's value in discussing that in relation to the clinic? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. It's, it's great. <laughs> if they ask me, I know what I'm going to answer now. <laughs> <I'm prepared. laughs> um, so um, I really think um, these courses is, is kind of a, an annoyance. And my previous psychoanalyst, the first one that I had, he said, well, you just have to be prepared that you have to explain uh, these courses every time that you are going to talk about your dissertation. And um, it, because, yeah, it's kind of uh, some machine, some sort of formulas that have its own logic, right? Like uh, the, the um, kind of uh, unconscious under, the conscious above, the places, the agent, the other, the semblance as agent, the other that receives, the cause down and the residue uh, as production uh, kind of left down. But I really think that... Um, as a, as a clinician, I have been always um, concerned about how can we understand the social with the way we can understand or, or we intervene in the clinic. Being such a powerful um, methodology, such a powerful theory to address human suffering, I'm always concerned of how that can um, be brought into the social. And I think that uh, Lacan uh, obviously thought uh, of that uh, in the event of the 1968, May 6, 1968 in, in France and the world. And um, he tries to extract positions that um, kind of fundamental relations, he defines that fundamental relations based on language, even when speech is not mediating. So structures, I think that is very important because a person in the clinic is not, is not talking about, um, just is not in their head, right? It's a social, a spatial thing. It's something that comes historically and um, from a, their lineage, from their tradition, something that has passed on to them, right? Like trauma significations and and that needs to be elicited maybe you don't need the discourses for the clinic by itself but you need kind of to understand that the person is not like a one alone in their head right it's, it's connected to a large <clears throat> collectivity and that influences the the very sayings right like that that that, that kind of uh, has defined the, the 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 direction of where their significations are going and then when we enter with those interventions such as in the examples that I mentioned um, something can reshift in those moments right we never know right because you just let you you just intervene but the landing you never know what is the landing or when is if ever going to make effects. But I think kind of having in mind the importance of, um, of having these um, kind of, a, that there's a structure in which the suffering of the individual is um, kind of hinged is, is very crucial. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, because it, it is interesting. I, I guess there's a bit of a trend of a separation between people who use discourses are like, you know, the, the non clinicians ma mainly and talk about social issues. And then there's the clinic where the clinical structures are discussed. And although, so, of course, some people use clinical structures to uh, explain some social issues. And uh, that's why it's interesting why, you know, why did you choose the, the discourses? But, but yeah, I like that. Um, right, right, right. And sometimes on the link. Yeah, and, and what you said, I think is important because sometimes it's almost like, um, yeah, this petite narcissism, like, oh, I'm a clinician, I know better than them, or oh, I'm a philosopher, they don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. So that sort of uh, tension is kind of stupid. And, uh, and 
we require both. We require both mm -hmm. to think that the time that we are living that is really a fucked up moment in, in history. Mm, yeah, 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 it is a bit reductive to say, yeah, that has nothing to do with, especially given Lacan's theory with the whole complexity right, right, right. of the, the link between that, which I think, yeah, you did uh, highlight very nicely. Uh, thank you, Sista. Um, okay, so any, <laughs> we'll open it up to everyone else. Any questions for Hilda? Okay, so Clint. Thanks very much, uh, Hilda, uh, your usual uh, bravura uh sort of uh performance as well as uh, uh you know really uh quite a, a fascinating um uh take us through uh, really i i, I want to uh, on the one hand i want to think back to those leaky jars of jouissance and the, the from the greek mythology that you talked about and that kind of unending work uh of uh, filling the jars and always leaking out uh which is such a fantastic sort of image but I was, and I was thinking about that toward the end as well uh, at two kind of moments. One, uh, when you talked about uh, surplus jouissance as the madness of human proliferation. And I wonder if there's a kind of a, a danger in, a, in eco discourse these days of kind of a Malthusian uh, notion that there's just too many people. Uh, so therefore, what we should do, what, what, what should we do? Should we have, uh, you know, sterilization programs for the poor? Uh, and so on, right? But that kind of idea, there's too many people, that's the problem. And, and if, or if the problem is more about distribution of waste, distribution of, 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 of economies. But also then how, in a Lacanian sense, how that connects up to uh, how you work through necessary versus contingent and possible versus impossible. So just very, very, uh, just to sum this up into a question. The impossible is what does not stop not being written. Correct. Um, and perhaps uh, the relation of surplus jouissance to the environmental crisis is what does not stop not being discarded. Um, that is a creation of kind of waste. So here's the question, is surplus jouissance a kind of waste? Hmm, and what for do you do sure. Yeah, 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 no, for sure. Thanks, thanks for, for that. And definitely is not about um, uh, let's sterilize the poor, uh, kind of what I am proposing, and I didn't dwell too much in what I have worked so much about the politics of inscription and rescription, which is precisely your your question, uh, kind of addressing. Um, yeah, I, I think that surplus reasons has always a loss, right? Always there's a loss and a residue of that sort of. Uh, cycle right that that's kind of cycle uh that was launched in yeah kind of uh when we speak when we act when we buy that's sort of the 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 kind of the the same uh um, topology of the drive so um surplus reasons it is a it has a place of the residual, it has a place of waste. And I think uh, the waste is a key aspect for the environmental crisis because um, yeah, it's, 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 it's that thing that we cannot imagine how, how it is possible that there's an island of uh, plastic already in, in, the, in, the, in the ocean, right? Like uh, how, how that uh, can be redistributed, you, you were right there um, on online on, on the letter how to redistribute is, is what I claim that it has to be uh, well at the individual level you have to kind of gain your loss at the at the in at the social level that loss needs to be redistributed right like uh, the waste instead of sending it to Indonesia from Canada it has to be here like what are we what are we do with these ways that you just uh, empty bottles and empty containers um, kind of uh, crazily, right? Is is that that proliferation that doesn't seem to to um, stop? And and it, it is not only a matter of an individual decision, but it, it needs to be collectivized, right? It needs to be collectivized. How that um, and and in some of those kind of a smaller that was kind of my question, right? In those smaller uh, communities, and we have here, for example, in the Gulf Islands in in British Columbia. Uh, which actually are unceded territories where we are living here of uh, indigenous communities, such as the Selail Watu, the Squamish, um, uh, the Musqueam. 
the, the, these kind of territories, some communities, for example, I know people in Denman Island, they, they have, uh, they are kind of working on permaculture and they manage their, their kind of their waste in, in a much more um, sustainable way. Like they really take care of their waste. They, they really take care of their shed in a way, right? Like it, it's how do you deal with those residues that compel your, your, your kind of um, that, that com compromise or that um, compel, I said, your um, waste, your expenditure rather, that, that's what I want to say, that compelled your expenditure. Those weights are yours. You need to take care of them, but but we we leave it to the strata, we leave it to to the the city. But um, how do we collectivize that? So, yeah, it's impossible, right? It's an impossible question. But thank you, thank you for for uh, yeah. It's it's about yeah how that not being written, not uh, stop not being written can be inscribe as i said it's not that we are going to have a meaning of that it's it's that it can it can be inscribed it can means that there's a letter that stops that proliferation right it's, it's almost like uh, the language stops in a way but it's not by signification it's by trapping some letter and um sort of um to 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 rest to kind of uh mark like put a mark on that waste. Yeah. Thank you, Clint. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Hamid, Let's see. Hello, Hilda. Hello, Amanda. Hiya. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for your great talk. I was wondering, Hilda, if you could elaborate more on love. You said that you've written what stops not being written, love. Could you please explain more? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, L Lacan talks about love in seminar 20 very de in detail. And he has also work um, in, yeah, from transference, uh, yeah, seminar nine, I use eight, sorry, uh, nine is identification. So uh, kind of a, uh, Love in psychoanalysis um, consists on uh, how the metaphor of love can be effectuated through the therapeutic uh, process, through the analytic process. That is to say, the analysis enters the, the, um, the kind of psychoanalytic uh, dialectic in the position of the wanting to be loved, right? The subject wants to be loved by the analyst. That's the mean of transference love. Not that everybody goes to analysis and falls in love with that um, analyst. That happens sometimes. But it means, in essence, that the person wants to be loved. That's love transference. Wants to be loved always. So through the process of analysis and, and by kind of a... Um, insisting kind of on bringing the desire uh, from the opaque side to the to the uh, front then by, by that there's a kind of a logical transformation where the analysis no longer is the one to be loved but the lover so it can go and love Love is a contingency, uh, from Lacan said, from um, that um, sort of a contingency of not being able to say the, the non-sexual relationship, the impossibility, but doing something with that. It's, it's contingent because we, we don't really know when or how the person uh, is going to love, and love not necessarily as a romantic um, ideal, right? But love as that active engagement with, um, with uh, that thing that happens to humans that make us feel completely different, right? Like that, that kind of uh, nourishes, love nourishes with lack in a way. And, and, um, and it's, it's, it's beyond the, the sort of that capture, imaginary capture of the Enamoración, no? Like uh, it's the, it's all about love and 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 hate, pretty much. Uh, the the 
kind of, but but it goes towards that which you cannot obtain, right? That that is the contingency that that I would say uh, kind of Lacan's advocates for that love that you cannot obtain that sort of can, can be an act of aloneness and nonetheless kind of bidding for that kind of um, that sort of uh, it's not only a feeling right because it's also a uh, love is kind of giving you sort of a a being in a way no by by engaging with another some some sort of a uh, in your aloneness, because remember, um, the non-sexual relationship is like you are alone in your enjoyment. You can be accompanied by the other, but you are alone in that in that uh, enjoyment. So it's kind of love brings that sort of uh, possibility of of in your aloneness being with other. Does that make sense, Hamid? Yeah, but if you could more address the uh, what stops not being written, I quite well, don't understand this. Right, right, right. What not stops being written is the yeah. sexual non-relationship, mm. right? We cannot, we cannot um, account how it is possible that we are sexed bodies, but that there's never, we never become one with the other. Unless, mm -hmm. yeah, you you are kind of um, you have a sexual relationship with your mother or your father, and then the sexual relationship is like returning to the one from where yeah. you come from. But that that sexual relationship is impossible, right? Like you are one plus one, it's two. One plus one is not one. That's the no like the logic, let's say, of the non-sexual relation, and then. That is, it doesn't stop of not being with, except by law, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you find a know-how to do with that non-sexual relationship. But for example, Lacan says, um, this is a very interesting, I think in seminar 14, the logic of fantasy, he talks about what, what makes satisfaction? Because obviously what we are talking about is about satisfaction, a way limits, satisfaction, all about the drive, right? Like what, what satiates the person? What satiates society? So uh, Lacan says that sa satiation or satisfaction has its um, uh, model on um, the sexual relationship or the intercourse pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that departs he, he makes the comparison of what satisfaction uh, sexual orgasm gives and what sublimation, right? And he says um, the, the sexual relation works with um, kind of uh, uh, hiding the lack in a way to, to be able to sort of have a report or a good thought, let's say, while the sublimation works departing from the lack. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, I don't know if that um, confuses more or gives a little bit more light in terms of how love is a contingency of how you try to resolve this riddle of how sexual mortals beings are in the world with others. Thanks, Hilda. Thank you, Hamid. Okay, I have another question from Mika. Uh, so uh, thank you for this uh, tremendous presentation. But um, I was thinking of if you agree that there is a tendency, to, uh, general uh, inclination towards reducing uh, the problem of surplus to uh, poetic acts or po poetry and we can be like uh, acts signifying uh, sacrifice or something something else, a kind of like a Heideggerian uh, uh, way, one could say. Uh, and uh, 
in, in here, I, I'm thinking also of the motto from Zizek that there is no fascism without its poets also. So, uh, and, and also I think that in Zizek's uh, thought surplus, uh, especially in 2017, uh, becomes the problem of uh, three surpluses, which is the surplus of enjoyment, of uh, surplus of power, on surplus of knowledge. And right. So, so in in here, there is, uh, I think, a way to see that the uh, reduction should be probably political in some way. Mm hmm. But but uh, what why what yeah I would ha return the question to you how do you uh, yeah because I was uh, thinking the surplus as yeah mainly as an inscription right as an inscription as a way of grasping that loss and making some sort of a letter that stops and that I can see it in the clinical as how it works. I don't see how it works very well in the social because obviously I'm not a political economist, but I, I see a way um, kind of going through the ethics of uh, psychoanalysis from seminar seven that um, kind of the sacrifice and the poetic act um, is sort of a, a possibility. But then you are bringing very um, auspiciously these three surpluses that indeed are in, in that article that, that I was referring, and also in the incontinence of the void um, uh, Zizek's book, uh, the enjoyment power and knowledge as surpluses, right? But um, how, yeah, I, I kind of return it to you because I don't know what are you thinking, how else could this go, right? How else could these be um, sort of um, how the how the leak can be de redirected? It's not going to stop. How can be redirected? That's 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 a question pretty much that I am asking you all. Yeah. But how do you think it? Well, uh, the short answer, which presupposes a long discussion, I am currently unable to un undergo, is that perhaps we could see it as the authentic political acts uh, mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not in the state of of explaining what the political act itself is and uh, we could refer to subjects already particularly subjects the end where he goes through of, of, of all the political discourses that he he, he explains and reduces it in a way to to political act mm -hmm. uh, Right, 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 right. When, I, when I'm thinking of, of, of the poets or poetry as, as a solution, or I'm, I'm thinking of a certain way that, that the uh, energies in political sphere are channeled towards some kind of, one could even say self-gratification that leads nowhere in, in politics. Totally, totally. I got you, I got you. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the issue is that I was not referring to poetic acts as poetry but poiesis as a creationist, right? That poiesis as that sort of a term from ancient kind of a philosophy that it's about creating, creating the possibilities, not so much poet, I mean, poetry too, and, and art as well, but poiesis as a way of something that it, it gets created. And the, then the political act could participate of a poiesis in a way, no? Uh, yeah, yeah, just... Uh, uh, join the, then I also was thinking of Heidegger's way of talking about uh, technique uh, as mm -hmm. presupposing the techne and, and, and also poesis and, and yeah right 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 yeah all right thank you uh, Mika thank you if there Alois. Uh, hi, Hilda. Can you hear me? Okay? Yes. Hi, Alois. Okay. Uh, nice to see you and a uh, great presentation. I was just wondering, um, I know you do like work on the internet as well. So I was just thinking about, I don't know, I've been thinking about the internet lately and specifically like the computer screen as a container, like a container for jouissance, um, like um, just in the ways that uh, we can kind of localize jouissance 
uh, like behind the computer screen. It's um, just a way for us to maybe experience Jouissance, um, just uh, maybe scrolling through Twitter or doom scrolling or whatever, which I think is, is a kind of a suffering. I don't know if you think of it as a Jouissance, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of containing Jouissance or at least containing our experience of Jouissance um, or just, uh, yeah. And then that just that idea of a container, uh, the computer screen is a container of Jouissance how that interacts with the idea of the, the leaky jar. Um, mm. just because, uh, yeah, that idea of containment uh, versus, I don't know, this leaking. So I don't know if the computer screen is like leaking, maybe I'm thinking about it too spatially, but where is the leak going? Uh, like, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if that, that, that opposition between containment and uh, leaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Thanks. Um, this is a very interesting uh, question. Thank you. Um, when you were talking, I was thinking about um, what uh, Lacan says in seminar three about psychosis, the foreclosure, how um, sort of a uh, foreclosure uh, he he adds this kind of a metaphor that you enter um information in in a, he says a machine right and then it only gets registered if you maintain uh, kind of the rhythm of the that the machine allows you to to punch the keys right so what is not registered right what what, what you are kind of punching in the in the keyboard gets lost in a way, it doesn't get registered. I, I, I could think one uh, possibility that is the leak, the, the kind of the, the things that we lose, no? like uh, the post that, that we maintain in drafts and then they never go anywhere or that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've, I have thought differently about the sort of the relationship to the screen well, for another, article that I haven't uh, written and I don't know if I, I will have to time to uh, to write but but I had already conceived sort of uh, thinking the relationship of uh, Jouissance with uh, in the digital as the relationship with the screen and almost um, as the kind of um, like a like a dust thing like a primary um, nowadays in, in the virtual world that we, we live. And maybe that's a little bit of an analogy in what you are kind of coming to, like some sort of a pleasure that you engage very kind of um, solipsistic, you and the, the, the kind of the, the screen is one, no? Like it's, it's pretty much a very narcissistic auto-erogenic. Um, and that social media, for example, is kind of a more like the the enjoyment uh, more kind of phallic perhaps because it's kind of uh, circulating among others is what I, the little I have thought about that uh, kind of uh, line of investigation, but I, I like um, your kind of bringing these, uh, yeah, the, the screen as a containment in a way, yeah, it's because it's you and the screen together forever, sort of, you know? <laughs> yeah, Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aloy. Okay, so we'll go to CM. Hi, uh, thanks very much for your talk, uh, Hilda. Uh, there was two points uh, in terms of uh, Jouissance and uh, uh, I remember reading something I thought was quite fascinating about when Donald Trump was in power that it kind of facilitated a Jouissance on both sides where the liberals produced an awful lot of enjoyment of being horrified about how terrible Trump was. So, and then on the other side, there was like with the Trump supporters, it was like a, the Jouissance of like the terrible things that the uh, foreigners are doing or, or oh, the wall isn't up yet. So it kind of facilitated this stuckness on both sides where it didn't actually matter that Trump wasn't building the wall because it was like the just the excessive pleasure of the, you know, if you built the wall, it wouldn't facilitate the Jewissons of like the foreigners coming in. So it was like, almost like this kind of bind between two political rivals that kind of was mutually uh, reinforcing something like that. But anyway, just one other quick point. There's an artist, uh, 
he's from Belfast. I think he's based in Scotland, actually, a guy called David Sherry. But he makes some really amusing performances that kind of really made me th thought of the idea of surplus jouissance. He did one that was a text based piece, but it involved a performance of going into a various restaurants and uh, sitting down at a table where uh, the food had already been eaten and the waiter would come over and he would say oh I've just finished my food I want to pay and you know in a few restaurants they were like uh, that's not your food that's somebody else's but eventually he found a place that uh, let him pay the bill for this meal that he had never eaten that somebody else had enjoyed you know I thought it was a um, fascinating yeah, it was, I thought it was a really kind of, like the first thing I thought was like, that's obviously just a crazy thing to do, but it had that sense of like enjoying the surplus that somebody else, and he has another performance where he, uh, another quite wacky amusing thing where he's like smoking a discarded cigarette that's been left on the pavement, but he's like lying on the pavement, trying to light it and kind of describing how it's going for him. So he has a, and another one where he's dancing on Coke, which is as in Coca-Cola on the floor of a gallery. So it's, you know, it gets kind of sticky and squeaky. Um, but he was a number, he never mentions Juissance or psychoanalysis or anything, but uh, for me, there's something about those uh, kind of uh, slightly crazy, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it yeah, you know, it's, it's very kind of, um inspiring this um reference to david sherry you said Chibi? yeah yeah sherry See? as in as in the drink as the, as okay it. yeah yeah david sherry i'll check it out anyway it's worth kind of checking out i think yeah no no and it's it's kind of a, it, your 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 intervention brings uh something important um in in terms of the payment who pays for what, right? Mm -hmm. Who pays for the enjoyment? And, and also the Trump uh, example that you bring is, is important because I absolutely agree. Everybody enjoy for good or for bad, for righteous or for kind of um, a congratulatory uh, sort of uh, feelings about Trump in power. But where is the surplus, right? Where is the surplus? And I, I just thought about the kids that were kind of um, detained, separated from their parents. Like those are the surpluses that get lost in this kind of uh, communal enjoyment that goes in different directions, but it still have a surplus that is not accounted for, no? Yeah. And, and yeah, how to pay for, for that uh, surplus. I really, yeah, you got me at the, the, he just sat there to pay for something. That someone enjoy it's such a um, counterintuitive to the logic that we have of the surplus mm. value of the yeah. surplus gain no but also that there's always another involved like that is um the quote that you mentioned at the beginning of like a tickle and it leads to a blaze of petrol like it's you know is uh, commonly known that you can't tickle yourself it's always like this kind of outside there's an, always an other somewhere that's a uh, kind of provoking it and I think like you say paying for someone's meal is quite like you know it's trying to uh yeah enjoy a surplus I guess yeah mm -hmm. okay thanks again yeah. thank you thank you for your contribution thank to the discussion thank you yeah, some uh, friend told me it's it's very good but very dense. <laughs> dense, dense. De yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect. Um, well, since Hilda, you mentioned dance, I guess that's a great place to end. Are we going <laughs> to dance? Yeah. Yes, virtual dance. <laughs> Why not? So again, thank you so much, Hilda, for that excellent presentation. It was really great and thank you everyone who came along and engaged with the discussion and uh, like i said in the beginning we do the, our next event do come along to that do register on eventbrite it'll be a film discussion of adieu lacan which hilda you you had that event before right yeah, uh, with yeah, the lacan, lacan salon, salon. yeah mm. it was really fun richard yeah. is wonderful yeah thank you so yes. much for the invitation uh amanda and uh callum yeah it, it was great thank you it's a great opportunity for me. Sure. Yes, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Have a good uh, night, evening, day. Sleep. <laughs> Bye.